Right, and I think people need to appreciate they're not going to get the answers till you, till you agree on to move forward. And then you work with the community and the parents, and you'll get to 90% there, and 10% of the things won't be, you won't be happy with. But, right. you know, you can't have it all. Steve Sherlock here for Franklin Matters, Franklin Public Radio, anywhere on the internet, WFPR.FM, and in the local Franklin Mass FM radio dial 102.9. Here today in the Franklin Radio Studio for an interview with Jeff Nutting. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Glad to have you. Yeah. It's been a few years since you stepped aside. Five. Five. Five years. May of uh, 2019. Uh, I got out just in time. <laughs> just in time, right. for sure. Right. So. so I know you're still riding. Right. And I know you're a neighbor of mine now. We'll right. get that disclosure right. out of the way. Right. But what have you been doing in the meantime? You haven't really, you have retired, but you've been keeping busy. So I flunked retirement. You uh, flunked retirement. That's re a good way to put it. Retired in May. <laughs> we traveled quite a bit, uh, Sharon and myself, and then... In August, I took an assignment in Hingham, uh, August of 19, and spent about six months helping them convert. Uh, they had bought a private water company that oh. provided water to them in Hull and Cohasset since the 1880s, and the town voted $114 million to buy the water company. Wow. It took 10 years to court and all that, but ultimately, they had to set up an organization. So I was part of a team, rules and regulations, and, and Board, budgeting, process, and all those kind of things. That and that was fun, and that ended in February of 20. Um, March, COVID arrived, <laughs> and um, end of March, I got a call from the town of Brookline looking for a town clerk to run their clerk's office because the town clerk had gone out ill in January unrelated to COVID, COVID yeah. and the assistant clerk, who was just a marvelous woman, was 75 with one kidney. Ouch. So she wasn't coming to work. And right. I said, well, I'm not a town clerk. Why don't you call one? And they said, I've called everybody. It's COVID. No one <laughs> wants to come to work. And I said, well, I'll, I'll go to work. And we had to run the, the local election that June. It was delayed. Um, we had to run the town meeting. Mm -hmm. And then we had the the primary in September and the Indeed. presidential sure and and I stayed until the following May and we were boots on the ground every day we were yeah. in the office and you know I'll speak for all the clerks that was a stressful year uh, uh -huh. setting up uh, first time we did in-person voting and setting up 16 uh, polling locations all over Brookline mm -hmm. and we mailed out 24,000 ballots Mail ballot. um, Absolutely. Um, we got a great staff of college folks to help come in and do process and make sure we didn't get it right and fortunately it all went off well and um, a new clerk was elected and I left but uh, it was a fun experience but um, you know you, you, we quickly forget that early days of COVID no one wanted to touch the mail no one wanted to uh, do any of those things so it, for example in the June election we had to shorten the polling hours because we couldn't get enough people to go work to the cover. polls yeah. So we cut it down to eight hours, which is a state minimum, versus normally you know six a.m. to eight p.m. Right, like uh, we do here in Franklin. When they normally sure. would do that, yeah. so yeah. Um, it was hectic, but that was fine. And I left there, and a week later, I became the DPW director in Sterling, Mass, um, up near Worcester. Sure. Yeah. And um, helped that out for five months, and then I had a little short break, and then I became the administrator in Lancaster. From there, I went to Norfolk. From Norfolk, I went to Hopedale. Uh, last year, I uh, led the cause for a successful override. Um, they were in desperate financial need. And and now I'm finishing up a six-month stint this week as the rec director in Brookline. So, so is there a town position you haven't had oh, yet? Oh, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they're all they're all enjoyable. People uh, love, you know, someone there to help. Uh, 40 years of experience, right. and right. Um, so uh, it's been enjoyable, but I still have plenty. They're not full-time, yes. so I have yeah. time to travel, ride my bike, hike, ski, yeah. do other things, to retire yeah. people. So that's kind of what I've been doing, and hope to do some more of it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it gives me flexibility, but... Um, it sounds like the best of both. Well, yeah, because ultimately there's no... You know, when you're the town administrator, it's a stressful job. People don't see that, yeah. but when you're an interim it's like people are just 
somebody's here to help. <laughs> right? And and why are they going to yell at you? Because you're only there for five right. months or seven, whatever the time right. lane. Right. And, and yeah. the, early in my career, I've, I did 10 of those. So I've done 16 interim uh, managers. Uh, I was yeah. the commissioner of public works in Cambridge. I've done all and so I have a good skill set at walking into places, assessing what needs to be done, and and trying to help out. Yes. So that's what's been doing. Definitely, yeah, yeah, it's been I fun. think you would agree. Uh, our interview with Rev Bev, who was the interim at Franklin, uh, excuse me, First Universalist right. Society, um, she had a great line. She says, "Well." I was already fired, so. Right, <laughs> right that's right. So, yeah, it, it, and I do a little consulting as well, so um, board training, things like that, mm -hmm. but two or three times a year. So uh, all's well on that front. So you're keeping busy. You're not missing what's going on in Franklin. You're uh, keeping somewhat aware of what's going on in Franklin. Um, so yes and no. Um, one of the things in our profession is, because I lived here and I worked here, I don't get too involved because Jamie is the town administrator right. and I'm not going to do anything that would undermine his uh, no. hard work and dedication. Uh, but, you know, I pay attention to what's going on and vote, um, talk to folks, you know, uh, recently uh, you know, I'm concerned about this override needing to get passed. And, and I, I also went to a school committee re recently because I think they came up with a great plan to change the you know, close some schools and realign things. And I thought yeah. from an educational perspective, that was a great idea. I watched the school numbers decline starting in 2008 for the rest of my career. And I was, you know, quietly behind the scenes saying, you should be closing the Davis there two or three years before it actually closed, just sure. based on the gross uh, empty seats. And yeah. then yeah. talking to the superintendent, and, go, and then the original plan came out to close the Kennedy and the pond, they, all at once. and. Right. You know, they they dragged their feet, for, you know, whether good or bad. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I said, Lucas, well, you know, this goes back six or eight months. I said, why am I going to vote for an override when you have schools open that should be closed? And then there was this new report came out, which I was very impressed with, yeah. uh, the hard work. And I really appreciate it. it's difficult on parents. You know, everybody wants their neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's nothing more constant in life than change. Yes. And they're still going to get a great education. Yes. And it's a tough pill to swallow, but instead of a quarter mile drive, now you got a mile and a half drive. It's mm -hmm. not Nebraska. You no. know, no. Uh, we have a great educational system, so I think if they can work through all the details once the school committee gives a, the A vote, it will work out. Yeah, and I think from my reporting perspective, to you, what well, you've alluded to, yeah, there was certain schools committees started the process, right. but then got into it and realized, well, we really can't do all of this. We'll just do this piece. Right. We really can't do Pe all of this. Right. We'll just do this piece. And this committee and the superintendent right. has picked up the pl pieces, right. filled in the gaps to the prior studies, and right. yeah, crafted the plan that, in, in many ways, was there, but it didn't have all the answers yet. Yeah. Now. This is just the plan. Right. The implementation details still need to be worked out. Right, and I think people need to appreciate they're not going to get the answers till you, till you agree on to move forward. And then you work with the community and the parents, and you'll get to 90% there, and 10% of the things won't be, you won't be happy with. But, right. you know, you can't have it all. But it, when I saw it, and I go, well, K-5 to five here and K-5 to five there, and following kids and giving them the support they mm -hmm. need and... You know, you heard some of the staff at the meeting saying, "We, the, from an educational perspective, this is a good plan." Yes. And so, well, and even just utilizing the two <laughs> facilities, so the Kellis Sullivan, Remington Jefferson, right. those are two schools. So now you're setting up kind of a K two school right. and a three five school in the other two school buildings. So that's even right. going to minimize, as I understand it. Right. And I'm certainly not the physical, right. you know, right. facility guy, but K to K to two. Well, th they've already got the kindergarten classrooms. Right. Three to five, there's not that much younger students than would have been there for middle school. So right. even the toilets and the bathrooms, etc., yeah. shouldn't be a whole lot of change done right. there. So in terms of you know, trying to fit it, yes, it is a consolidation. It is a change. Right. People don't necessarily like change. Right. But I think it best utilizes I, I what we've so. got. Yeah, I, I, and I sent them an email the next day saying that's a great plan. And, you know, I think the people that... You know, the parents that were at the meeting and expressed concern uh, is natural. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, that, you know, I love my neighborhood. I love my school. Mm -hmm. um, I ma it makes me feel safe and et cetera. But in the long run, 
not only do you have to provide a great education, uh, you do have to be fiscally accountable. And while the schools won't save a great deal of money, certainly there'll there'll be some consolidation, and certainly um, the facilities budget. I think they were showing a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars savings, which you can go back put back into the other two schools to do the necessary upgrades that need right. to get done. So right. um, yeah, and I think you're just going back to the Davis Thayer piece. I think right. net. It was about a million, so it was like the seven fifty on right. the facility piece, or maybe right. fifty five hundred thousand right. on the facility piece. And then, because you're now consolidating two schools, real respectfully, there's some level of administration that would be right. duplicate. Right. You so still have the same teachers and same teachers in the classroom. And um, that's when and, they and said the teachers are going to follow the kids. Right. So there should be minimal change there. Right. And again, that's still also part of the. Uh, you know, contract negotiations to a certain extent, yeah, but right. most teachers are going to want to follow the kids. Right. So I think that's, you know, it's it just, in some ways, unfortunate it all got confused with the override issue, and they're not really related in this, in, in one sense. One's an educational plan, and and one is a, a need for financing, and it's all coming together quickly, and right. it's hard for a lot of folks to absorb all this at once. Um, I, I don't disagree. Lesson is, learned yeah. from all from, these things. Even from a reporting perspective, it's, <laughs> I'm challenged to keep up with it. But right. yeah, it's it's here. The key question is, okay, how are we going to make it better going forward? Right. And that's where I hope that all the parents who have stepped up stay part of the implementation plan because then they'll help make it right. work for all of us. Right. Because if they just go away, that doesn't help. No, I... Well, Parents need to be involved in the kids' education anyway. I mean, whether it's at home or if you can volunteer here and there, absolutely. But, um, you know, they got plenty of time. Uh, if they start now, it's 16 months plus or minus before mm -hmm. the doors open. And, you know, if, they, if the team that came up with this plan can work with all the other folks that are invested, I think it's all going to work out. Yeah. You know, I so uh, I, I think people have to take a deep breath and get over the change and then say, okay, it's happening. Now let's spend our energy and time, as you stated, uh, making make, this work for the better of my kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, that's good. Definitely. No complaints. And then the override. The override. Then, now, this has been something, at least from my reporting, um, Chloe in, well, tw 2007 was the only successful right, override. Right. 2.7 million. Right. We yeah. tried again in 2008, Came tried close. again in 2010. Right. And then at that point, the, one of the key pieces that's somewhat forgotten, but the long range planning team got put together right. to develop the right. process for the long range plan, which is now incorporated into the regular. Right. And that's what Jamie's been doing, right. following on from you. Right. 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 Absolutely. The other piece, though, the schools, from what I'm understanding, hadn't yet done their five year plan until this year. Yeah, I think so. Okay, th that's what it is. <laughs> right. But now they need to do it for five years going forward, and now they're setting up, hopefully, to do that with the new school plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then on the the number side, well, we also had was it twenty fourteen? We tried the debt exclusion for the for roads. roads, correct? And people said no, nope. we don't want to yeah. do that. <laughs> that's okay. Like, that's okay. A, that's their uh, right. I mean, I think it shouldn't. Most people don't understand the financial picture of the town nor you know would they normally they have a life to lead and they you right, know right. and and number two i mean it's a pretty great town i mean we have awesome public services we've tried to provide not only the basics but recreation and and opportunities and you know the library with the new building is just a game changer mm -hmm. and, sure. but on the face of it it all just seems like it goes together and, and looks seamless and yeah. You know, in my 18 years, every year was a financial struggle. Right. And I think the police chief said it right. When I was hired, we had 50 folks in the police office. We're going to hire four more. Within a few years, we were down to 42 or 43 right. uh, in the force. Uh, fire had the same result. I laid off countless people um, between the early recessions and then the 2008-09 mm -hmm. uh, debacle. So... It, and now it's 14 years later, and they're finally getting to where they were going to be in 2020. Right. I mean, 20, right. 2001. 2001. And now yeah, you yeah. and the community's changed. The population trickles up a little, but we're an older community. The paramedics are running out the door more than ever. Mm -hmm. 
um, people have different expectations of police today and um, so there you know it all seems like it's pointed to the school but the reality is if you don't fund the school this year um, you're gonna have to fund them at some point or you're gonna start cutting municipal jobs and sure. will be because the school can't take the whole no. enchilada um, and you're gonna be right back um, doing it and the, and post covid the world has changed and mm -hmm. um you know i i don't i'm not on facebook but people tell you know you see well my taxes went up 20 percent last year i don't really believe that um we got to get our fiscal house in order i would love someone to go talk to jamie or come talk to me and explain to me how you think you can cut a million dollars never never mind six million dollars mm -hmm. right the only way that happens is jobs go out the door right and then where those jobs go, where are the big jobs? Police, fire, biggest departments, DPW, DPW but a, a third of those are water and sewer, and they're funded through the enterprise account. Right. So that's off the table. Mm -hmm. And schools, um, we underfunded the library for eight years at least. Right. Uh, now at least minimum. Yeah. Um, Jamie mentioned that in the fin campaign, right. that we're just a, just a hair yeah. above, above the, the minimum required. required. And then you don't meet that requirement. You're a... You know, you might as well shut the library because you can't access books and... The interlibrary so, loans. Right. So, yeah. I mean, there's so many barriers that the average person wouldn't understand and don't understand that we don't manufacture anything except customer service. Yes. And the only way to save money is to lose bodies. And I think the school administ the business administrator, you know what, every three jobs they got to cut a fourth. Mm -hmm. um, so the override unequivocally is needed in my mind, um, and I, I think the the challenge is the short timeline. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the schools needing to have an answer by June fifteenth, but I would hope you know if it passes, it passes. If it fails, I would hope they take another bite at the apple in November. Yeah, because problem's not going away. No. Okay. No. It's only going to get worse. Yep. And if I can lock a guarantee in that, you know, the pledge that they put together, which I thought was a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. and say, hey, we're going to come at, when we're leaving you alone for five years, uh, we'll make do no matter what, is better than an unknown. Absolutely. Um, and then you're in a crisis. Uh, yeah, so. Because that, I think, is one of the key pieces when, certainly from my perspective in 2007, 8, and 10, it right. was the lack of trust in the process. Right. People didn't trust the numbers. Right. I think since that time, hopefully, people have seen what has been done. Mm -hmm. The financial audits had some issues at the beginning. Those yep, have gradually right. gotten clean. In the last four or five years, they've right. been generally right. absolutely Spot clean. On. Nothing wrong with the audits. So there should be trust in the process between yours and then now Jamie's leadership. Right. There should be trust in the leadership. Granted, I mean, it's Got customer them. service. August. Right. You're always going to get some objections. Right. But That's okay meeting the needs of all of us right and all of us have to be involved and and you know you, you have empathy there is a small percentage of people that struggle every day uh, clearly affordability know, whether, is whether it's a key you know piece. 10 percent or 15 percent of the people that are you know day to day mm -hmm. um and i don't really you know we have the tax work off you know, we have some other options but it's a real struggle um but most people just decide whether they want to they understand the sense of community. They understand that property values are based on great public education, uh, great services. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at you know the last 20 years and things like the new high school and the Del Card and the library mm -hmm. and the things that make Franklin a great place to raise a family and live, will slowly be eroded um, without some extra funds. And you know, oh, you don't need the money, but they. People don't understand the drivers of government and the constraints we're under. So right. um, it's hard to sell that picture uh, in is. a short timeline. No. Um, so that's my worry. But, you know, I was thinking about this, about folks that are kind of struggling. You know, when my mom retired 30 years ago, she only was able to hold on to her house for about five years because ta everything goes up, sure. right? Yeah. But back then... It was easy to go rent an apartment for five hundred dollars a month or yes. whatever. Yeah. That doesn't exist today. We just don't and, have the uh, housing supply right. across and, the board. Right. That so would be available, thereby the rents would come down. Correct. The affordability would be down. So you know, she had options. I don't know if people today that live in their house they've been in forty years have those same options. Right. Or if you 
move to Florida or some other know, out some, of state, some, out of New uh, England place. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that I, I that's an issue, but I don't have an answer for that. No. Um, no, it's and, unfortunate. That's where know. at least um, I credit the council as well in some of the whether it's the Franklin for all and the, now the master plan process right. coming up with. These are the things we need to change in order to at least increase the density so we can have more of that broad right. space, uh, broad w uh, range of housing styles. Right. Because even when I moved into Chestnut Ridge, as you're aware, right. we had a two-story colonial and the kids are gone. Right. I, I don't need that. Correct. <laughs> Finally sold it to a couple coming in with a nine-month-old. That's perfect. That's right. <laughs> but there really is no kind of senior in between. housing. There's no in there's, between. There's nothing in there. Yeah, I mean, the so. federal senior housing or the housing behind the high school and new ones going up is really... Right. Mostly for a single person, they're 550, 600 square feet. Right. Um, you have to be income limited. But for the average person that, you know, maybe has some income uh, that, but can't sustain taxes, heat, lights, mm -hmm. and, a, big, and a, big, a bigger house that they don't need, yeah. there are no options. No. And there's not going to be for the foreseeable future, no. Um, no. unfortunately. No, I, um, I don't see that because it's, it's a demand-driven world. And I th it was a stat uh, that I saw recently in terms of how many houses and rental units even have been on the market. Right. And there's like less than a dozen <laughs> at right. any point in time. Right. Generally, it's less than a handful at right. any point in time. And right. when there's that short supply... The right. demand is there. The demand is going to keep bidding, bidding, bidding. That's crazy. You know, it's funny. My daughter, who's a physician, is uh, moving to Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio, to mm -hmm. Ohio State, uh, with her husband. And so I was looking online, and and you can buy a thirty-two hundred square foot colonial, three or four bedrooms, two car garage, four hundred seventy-nine thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That was like a, like a few years ago <laughs> here. <can> and <laughs> you know. <laughs> Dad, I can buy a beautiful condo for under two hundred thousand. I mean, it's a whole different world once you get out of the you know the eastern mass. Even western mass doesn't have these prices no, that we no, have. So, no. yeah. So anyway, I hope the override uh, prevails. I think um, you know people make excuses. Most people that vote no, it's their right. Choose not to. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not. It's not an affordability issue. Right. Uh, they either don't want to spend money. They don't trust the government. Uh, unfortunately, I think the national government um, chaos has trickled down into local government. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's unfortunate because, I, as I used to say, the federal government doesn't educate your kid, put an ambulance at your front door, uh, you know, give you a library. They do nothing mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, right. pick up your trash. Right. And people pay attention to that when they should be focusing on their own community as well. Absolutely. To say, wow, I get all these things and I have to pay for it, but what if I didn't get all these things? Right. You know, who doesn't want to live in a community with a great um, fire department that saves lives all the time? ISO and, number one uh, certified. Uh, Police are certified. Right. right. And DPW is recognized. I mean, you name it. Everybody's got some recognition, including right. the schools. They're not as high as they could no. be, but that's because well, of some of the other issues. Well, they've struggled for so long with funding. Um, you know, they peaked way back in the early 2000s. And, and the funny, the ironic thing about the override that passed in 2007 for $2.7 million, mm -hmm. within two years, our state aid was cut by $3 million. So... The override ultimately, I mean, I guess it could have, it would have been worse, but right. the state just took away all the money that we were and, using to and make ends meet. 2008 and the recession hit, so right. the valuations changed. Everything so. changed, <laughs> right? And then you don't get the same revenue from hotels and people don't buy new cars for excise tax. So the economy directly affects in some ways, other than the property, even the property tax, uh, the revenue stream that we get. Right. So... Um, I think the one thing, Franklin, during my tenure, the council always wanted to expand the tax base to keep taxes down. Correct. And yeah. um, so that's good. And and while people don't care what taxes are in other towns, um, it's still a huge bang for your buck here. There, uh, if you do a comparative study absolutely. for what you pay yeah. and what you get. Uh, but again, most people are taking the kids to soccer or, you know, they're not paying it, you know, it's hard to get volunteers mm -hmm. um, involved. So yeah. um, it's a challenge. Yeah, so many uh, wants for that attention. 
right. go look at this shiny thing, look at this shiny right. thing, right. instead of paying attention to what's happening out in front on the sidewalk and the streets with the school buses. Right. That's, that's really, really matters. That's the nuts and bolts. So yeah. uh, we'll see what happens. And then, you know, again, if it passes, great. If it doesn't, I really think they should vote again. Because um, you'll have 80% turnout for the presidential election. Yeah. Uh, and you have a lot more time to explain. Really you know, I, I can, having been refine involved. Refine the story. Right. And, you know, you do the neighborhood meetings, do the senior center, mm -hmm. do all the places where, you know, you get invited to talk for 20, 30 minutes and let people ask questions because those one-on-ones are much easier to understand than at a public meeting where you're thinking of one thing and other people are asking right. other questions right. and well, you can't get into the meat and potatoes of right. uh, Well, and answer. that's where it's the extended conversation. Mm. I ask you a question, you give me an answer, and then I come back. And right. We work through the details, and right. that takes time, and right. you can only do that one-on-one. -on -one. Right. You know, or, you know, if you have eight people in a room, you know, in somebody's living room or... Mm -hmm. um, right. So despite the world of social media and... The outreach, it's not so much a two-way dialogue. I right. mean, certainly you can have yeah. Zoom or webinars, but it's just different. Uh, and I don't know if the world's changed so much that people don't even want to do that FaceTime anymore. So um, it's, it's uh, unfortunate, yeah. We, no. uh, we can't solve that piece. We just have to <laughs> try and make the awareness so we get people out to vote and right. then be yeah. informed to vote. In the end of the day, I always said, it's your government. Uh, it's your tax dollars. Mm -hmm. Here's your information. Make the decision you think's best, and and then you go live with it. Right. And you know we've had a lot of failed overrides, and we survived. But I I think by the skin of our teeth in some departments because you know we we have great employees, and but you know 20 years ago I mean we had some school shootings 20 years ago. We had the world's just crazier. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. You know and safety and and. Is just more important than it was. Definitely, as you know, when we were kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we grew up. You know, you could ride the bike almost right. anywhere, and now you're lucky if the kid can get out of the neighborhood on right. the bike. Right. Well, the parent getting arrested for. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was an article in the Globe the other day about helicopter professors with all these protesters. They're getting involved with the. Pro, the college kids, they go, okay, I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> helicopter parents have become helicopter, helicopter professors. professors. <laughs> I guess an interesting article. So yeah. so that's kind of what's been doing, um, yeah. both, both for me professionally and personally. I, I'm i still a big, uh, uh, doing my 18th year uh, at the Pan Mass Challenge, the 185-mile bike ride for the Jimmy Fund, mm -hmm. Dan Faber. Uh, From great, great Sturbridge to Plymouth. Sturmish to P-Town. P-Town. So they'd stop at uh, Mass That's Maritime. Right, so yeah. it's 110 miles yeah. day one and about 75 day two. And we have a, a team in Franklin, Fat Tuesday, headed by Tim Brightman. It's his 37th year wow. uh, riding. Yeah. Um, yeah. His uh, brother died of cancer when he was 27. Yeah. And so he's been doing a great job. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've incorporated... Uh, Jeff Roy's old team into our team. Okay, because I thought he had a separate team. So he had now Phil's friends. I was Phil's on friends. it years ago, yep, and then yep. I transitioned, and now Jeff and there's five of us from the old team on the Fats team. Fats Tuesday. And, yeah, yeah, we ride every Tuesday, um, yeah. and then ride on weekends, and we train a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and our team raised uh, over $450,000 yeah, last year. Yeah, you've been rather year, successful. So. It's a good group. So. I follow a number of you, and... Right, contribute so, as well. You know, everybody has a cause, and yep. um, this yep. is the one that I, um, I'm a big supporter of our food pantry. I hope other people are. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Y in town. That's another thing. Another so, contribution opportunity for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. I, you know, last weekend I, my Sharon and I walked up and down 140 with those green bags, <laughs> cleaning up the litter. We do, you know, every year. It's like sure. I would hope. I wish the stores would clean up and all do we, I mean, there's nobody lives there practically, right, right. but it's just unfortunate that the litter that we see. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it's an example of if you give your town two hours a year or five hours a year, yeah. and everybody did that that could, wouldn't it be a m much better place? Much better. And it doesn't take yeah. a lot of effort. No. no. And just find a cause, whether it's a charity, volunteering at a church or a charity mm -hmm. or picking up litter. Yep. Um, it's not hard work. It's no. just getting out there and making a small commitment. Yeah. And you don't have to do it every week. 
no. um, on so, your time, on your schedule, and yeah, yeah it, it can work. So, I know uh, as part of the radio outreach, there's over a hundred nonprofits well, that's the, right. based here in Franklin. Right. And clearly some big ones, HMEA, et right, cetera, right. but and why. Look at the SAFE Coalition. Down to the little, right. well, the SAFE Coalition has come up from nowhere in, you, right. six, in what, eight years? <laughs> right, but that's a great cause. I it mean, is. so this, you know, pick the, something you're passionate about. So um, the other thing I've been doing, I was elected to serve on the board of directors of Milford Hospital. Oh, okay. So this yes. is my second year, and um, it's been an, an enjoyable time and a challenging time. Uh, the hospital recognized early on that post COVID that they were not going to survive financially Ooh, and yeah. in lieu of the disaster you see at Stewart, Stewart right. um, the board through the leadership of Ed Kelly and, and the team um, made a decision early on to affiliate with UMass Memorial which will happen sometime this year um, so that our patients it will be seamless mm -hmm. you know and yep. uh, the employees are will be protected and you know ultimately as you said with the school, some of the back room, will, you know, the IT and HR and some mm -hmm. of those things will be consolidated. Sure. But, yeah. you know, the nurse on the floor and the doc and, and those people, you're not going to notice a bit of difference. And, right. and there'll be an infusion of capital into the hospital, which will help us modernize the, uh, you know, equipment. I mean, running a hospital. I thought a town was difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm on the finance committee at the hospital as well, and it, how any of them stay in business with the rules, the regulations, the insurance, uh, free care, um, it, 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 you know, it's staggering. It's, it's staggering. Um, there's a big learning curve, but um, so we're going through that process, and I, I we're going to come out. Make the, some sense of it. <laughs> gonna, well, but we're also going to come out the other end, you know, with a better, better facility. Uh, the great staff still there, and you noticed uh, they opened a new facility in Medway yes. uh, yep. a they month expanded. ago, yep. right? Yep. And so yep. you know their network's getting bigger up, so you have easier access the closer you are to a wide range of uh, uh, services. So um, the big plan is great it's just that we couldn't you know it's like owning a little drugstore in a cvs world and yeah, you just no. can't compete um, you need the network in so, order to be able to give you that wherewithal the right. buying power which is right. one key piece certainly and umass you know we've had an affiliation with them for a very long time a lot of the docs do residency there mm -hmm. we still have the dana faber relationship we so have the, you, you know so we have all those relationships you know for the foreseeable future will stay in place right and and hopefully we'll expand some more so mm -hmm. um, so that's been a lot of time and energy and effort but um, it's a, just another way to kind of give back to a, the region um, uh, here well instead sure. of just the yeah. community oh, well thank you for doing yeah. what you yeah. do and so, uh, it sounds like y you so, continue on to, to fail retirement in yeah this case. <laughs> well as you know I, i'm also the worst job in life i'm on the condo board uh, it's like being a little town manager for 56 people and it, quite frankly it's a good group but we have right. great residents and we have a good board but you know it's checking things out somebody complains yeah. and, and legitimately and oh, we yeah. try to resolve things sure. and well, balance the budget and keep the fees it's the oh, same thing over and over a lot of those are still back to kind of service and the right. people and right. ma managing so. a budget in order to do the service yeah so yeah. that's been fun i've been doing that gosh i did it five years when i first got on and then now it's been so it's been 10 years i've okay. been doing out of the 15 i've lived there so yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably I keep certainly going. Certainly, have kept busier than ever in right. doing this. Right, and I'm enjoying it. I, I'm not looking forward to retiring further. <laughs> right, I, I just find that you know, in the summer, I can keep myself busy, but come the the winter time. Well, you know, and yeah. I love to ski, and we do hike in the fall and everything. Sure. We also. Sharon and I volunteer at the Appalachian Mountain Club okay. in uh, Crawford, New Hampshire. We. Okay. Um, you know, we high, have hiked the 100 highest mountains in New England, wow. which okay. uh, only about a 1,000 people in the last 65 years have done. Okay. And so we go up to the Highland Center, which is a, a big lodge up there, and we provide hiking uh, guidance and weather information. Mm -hmm. And people come from all over the country, oh, in yeah. fact, Germany, uh, sure. and they want to know trail conditions and what's the easiest. Yeah. And, and so we get to go up and get free room and board and give free advice. and. Mm -hmm. 
get to do some hiking, and so that's been a fun time for us as well. well yeah, give and take at the same time. Yeah, so I mean, we'd go up a day early time. and do some hiking, sure. and then uh, yeah. spend the couple, three days uh, yeah. providing information. Because when you're out there, the weather does matter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the news has uh, had from time to time, you know, people just unprepared in the wrong spot, and unprepared. Um, ego. Um, there's a, you know, we just shake our head every time we read yeah. one of those stories. They, and even, even very experienced people get themselves in a situation that they shouldn't. And our attitude is the mountain's going to be there tomorrow. Right. So we've turned around a couple times and mm -hmm. said, you know, we'll come back. it's too icy. We don't have the right equipment or the weather's going down quick. And, you know, we've gotten caught in rain, but okay, we're prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we were hiking the 100 highest, there were about 10 mountains that have no paths. Oh. So you have to drive. In one case, you drove 20 miles down a dirt road to where you think you're supposed to park, and then you have to go to the top of the hill. Sure. And and so you have to prepare, be prepared that you're not coming home that night. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you get a flat tire. Um, yeah. It's harder to navigate, and it takes longer than you want. Mm -hmm. So preparation, like in anything in life. Right is you know what's the worst case scenario so we'll be doing a hike in june up mount washington and four or five other mountains but i'll still have a puffy jacket with me sure and a wool hat the uh, can because change up there. It, it can <laughs> snow okay and but people from other part of yep. the country oh these are sm short mountains they're only five six thousand feet what can possibly go wrong oh yeah and then yeah. you look at the 150 or so people died yeah. in the white mountains uh, things go bad very quickly very quickly and so it's just about preparation mm -hmm. and i think the other thing i um i got my pilot's license at 17 and they flew for 40 something years and it's the same mantra right prepare prepare train right. train right Always use the checklist. Yes. Okay. Even though you've been doing the same thing for 35 years, the checklist you matters. always do the checklist. And hiking is the same thing, um, or any sport where you're exposed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the people that do unfortunately get into deep trouble either think they're going to outrace the weather, they're mm -hmm. totally unprepared. Mm -hmm. um, you get a t-shirt and sneakers in winter on you know a 5,000 foot peak with a 50 knot wind. I mean. Yeah. It's, and you feel bad for the people they left behind. Right. And, but so anyway, if we can help people during those hikes, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So try to do a wide variety of volunteer work yeah. as well. And keeping yourself busy, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that's good. And stay tuned for the election and um, see what happens. Yeah. Well, thank you for spending some time and sharing yeah. the yeah. multiple stories. <laughs> yeah. I learned a bunch. Hopefully, I'm sure the listeners did as well. Yeah. I just want to say, you know, I got to give hats off to Jamie and his team. Uh, when I hired him back in 2014, I knew I was heading towards retirement. I'd never had a deputy. I was overwhelmed at that point with social media, and and, mm -hmm. and I was so thrilled that he got the job and is doing a fantastic, incredible amount of work. Mm -hmm. um, the job's hotter today than when I had it. Sure. Um, I also, you know, councils change, and this council's fine, but mine was more, Jeff, just get the job done. Um, and I'll, I'll remember I got hired in 20, 2001, and they said, look, Franklin's grown dramatically. We have sewer running over the uh, ball field, the town hall, the fire station's old, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we need a capital plan. So I spent all summer doing the capital plan and coming up with a plan that didn't require a tax increase. Of course, that's um, a nice wrinkle. Yes. Um, <laughs> to buy a town hall, build, do the municipal building, new yep. fire station, new senior center, new DPW, do the museum when the senior center, yep. uh, new rec fields at Dacey, uh, Dacey Field, right. um, and $20 million in water sewer. And I presented the plan to the council in December, and 10 minutes later, nine hands went up. And and then we did all those things. Right. So if if we didn't have a council, you know, everybody to looks approve. at the TEA, Absolutely. but it's a it's a partnership between yeah. the elected officials and the yeah. the the CEO to move the community forward. Yeah. And fortunately, all my tenure here, as a whole, the council tried to move the community forward, mm -hmm. and I think they're trying to continue to do that. Yes. Um, but the challenges remain. So yeah. I give hats off to all those people. And, and in the school committee, hottest 
government, hottest job in Franklin. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a volunteer. Sure. And yeah. the superintendent's job, uh, no one, who, who wants that? But no. um, yeah. they continue to do great work. So. Oh, it just reminds me, too. I know uh, I've talked with Frank Falvey because a couple of years ago there was rumored that there may be a charter commission, et cetera. Right. So we had spent some time. And if, there, if and when there is a charter commission, right. my piece would be the schools, if they're managing 70% of our budget, right. they should do it with more than seven people. Yeah. They should have nine. Right. So it would be on the committee. On the committee. Yeah. They well, should have nine. So the other thing is um, more continuity. I mean, we've been lucky. We haven't only once, twice in Franklin's history, once in 97 and once in 99, seven of the nine councils got taken out of office. Right, right. And since then, it's been one or two. You know, people leave, maybe somebody right. loses. But right. we've had good, you know, this council, you know, Glenn and Tom and, Bo, you know, some they've been on a long time. Sure. But if they all, five of them walked out the door tomorrow. You lose that institutional uh, knowledge. Um, that's not healthy for a community. No. And so no. if they have a charter commission, I think the big debate, well, do you go to three-year terms? Right. To, to make it stagger. To make piece. it stagger. Yep. And there's yep. always been the back and forth about that. Mm -hmm. um, back when I was here, they talked about four-year terms with half the council. Uh, for one year and then but the councils at the time well I don't want to run for four years because it's a long time <laughs> so I'm sure if that ever got to be a charter commission that would be a, one of the biggest debates about right. those kind of the Correct. school and, yeah. and thing and because that would be my next piece I mean to me I would I always thought the assessor should be appointed um, you know uh, I think that if, if you look at how many people run for assessor in 25 years there's probably been two competitions mm -hmm. and it's kind of a technical very and, and you have to go to school for that right. by law. You have to take a class, or you can't be an assessor. And you know, maybe you know, visit visit that, and I, you know, maybe the planning board. I mean, all those things would be on the table. But mm -hmm. at the very least, I think finance people. You know, we got the treasurer to be appointed. I yes. think that was critical. The right. assessors. Not. It, it would just be easy to get people. No one wants to run for office, fill up forms, put up signs. Are they willing to volunteer? Make it easier for mm -hmm. them. Sure. And. It's not like they're a policy board. The assessors have to follow state law. Well, uh, that was one of the things that I found out very quickly because when I retired, one of the first meetings I went to was that Thursday morning, the right. Board of Assessors, right. and I realized, oh, there's a 10, 15-minute public portion, but the rest was an executive session right. as they went through the abatements. Right, because that's private. And I, and I totally understand it. It right. makes a whole lot of sense, right. but... I, I didn't know yeah, because you know, it had never been there. It's all, it's a, his, you know, the only discretion they have is you get a $100 uh, or, two, you know, if you're entitled to some kind of abatement, how much is that? But right. beyond that, everything is statute. Right. So get people that know what the business is. And um, so whether that ever comes to pass, but mm -hmm. I think the framework of Franklin's government is pretty strong. Could you make it a little tweak, tweak it to make it a little healthier? I, from what I've seen in my years reporting, mm. we're certainly much more responsive. Oh my gosh! So quickly compared to others, where you know, if something came up, then they got to wait for a town meeting next year. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> town meeting form of government, except if you're a really, really small, really small, small town, right. is so outdated. Yeah. Um, the the one of the problems we have in the Commonwealth is you have to have twelve thousand people to have a city. Yeah. And. To me, I would have this form of government in 75% of the communities in the Commonwealth. And there's, you know, there, we still have towns with 600, 800 people. Nothing, you know, who no. cares? They, but yeah. every place around here, it's more efficient, it's more effective. You have, you have nine people that are engaged versus trying to educate 200 people that come to a town meeting that spend several one, one, hours. <laughs> but, one, but, but once a year, and how are you supposed to catch up to, you know, you, you walk into a room. And the XYZ company is having an annual budget debate about their $140 million budget. And what are you supposed to know as a, right. unless you have done all the homework? Sure. And, and I think the beauty of the council form of government is you get homework every week or every two yeah. weeks. Yeah. And you can be fully informed. And whether you like the, uh, the vote or not, they're doing it on a basis of information. So, yeah. And you're right. You can move much faster. Uh, a good example, and we were given tax breaks to Hamilton Technology yeah, and TIFFs, TIFFs and, and that that lures them to come to town mm -hmm. to get a short-term tax break, and they bring all those jobs and spend all that sure. money. But after the town approved it, and it only took us three weeks. Three weeks, Okay, yeah. I went, yeah. you have to go to the state, and the state 
um, they have to approve it. And they, they have 15 people they do all in one day. And mm -hmm. every other town, oh, we took, this took a year and a half. This took nine months. And I, and I was the 11th town to show up. I go, this took two weeks because the council didn't meet. For, if they met, in, you know, it would have taken a week shorter. And everybody's looking at us. This took three <laughs> weeks. And I said, yeah, because we want jobs. We want sure. high-paying jobs to, to come yeah. to town and spend money and stay in our hotels and buy our food and pay mm -hmm. a meals tax. So sure. in a town, it just takes forever. Yeah. So yeah. anyway. Tax incentive fin financing. Finance, right, right. And that's generally been a 10-year kind of graduated Right. So any, So it's a... If you're coming to build a manufacturing facility or you're expanding one, you can get a tax deduction on the expansion. The expansion. The original piece. land and all that, you still get the same tax, but you can get a tax break if the town wants to give you one for up to 10 years. You know, maybe you pay 10% the first year and 20 or 30. They're but graduated uh, over time. Yeah, graduated, to, and you have to meet, you have a legal obligation on the number of people you employ. Sure. And... Ten years goes by like nothing. Then we get 100%, and we have all these jobs right. for people uh, in Franklin. And I think from what I've just seen through the news between Tegra and Coal Chain right. and something else, they've continued to expand since they've Correct. been here. So right. those have all been successful. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So And they're great companies. So, But it's an example of how a city form of government can move quickly when they're a benefit to the community. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. We'll see. Yeah. We will indeed. Well, so I'll be back in five years. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we'll check in and yeah. find out what else you've done. See yeah. if there's other town jobs that you haven't yet. Well, <laughs> we'll see. I, yeah, I've probably done more than anybody in the Commonwealth, but it's fun. So indeed. Well, thank you again, Jeff, yeah. for taking time. This has been fun. Yeah, and for pleasure. listeners, thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed and learned a few things or two. And a quick reminder: we do this because Franklin matters. matters. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008, and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy it. And by the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.